I think it's high time we start exploring some Buddhism on this channel, as many of you in the audience have already pointed out. It is, after all, one of the largest religions in the world, and one that has a lot to offer when it comes to history, beliefs, and practices. As is always the case, of course, Buddhism is incredibly diverse with many different schools and ideas and ways of understanding certain teachings, much of which can take years and years of study to understand. Just like with Hinduism, we're not going to be making some grand video called What is Buddhism? Not only because it's so incredibly broad and, and complicated, but also because several other people have already done that and made really great videos that you can advise if you're interested in that. Instead, what we're going to do here is we're going to dive straight into some Buddhist philosophy, some very significant schools of thought and thinkers within that tradition and try to understand what those schools and those thinkers are saying, how they understand Buddhism, and through that we can gradually get an understanding of this vast and incredibly rich religious and spiritual tradition. And there are a few ideas associated with Buddhism as famous as the idea of emptiness or shunyata. Most associated with the incredibly important Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna, who teaches that all things in existence are empty. This is an idea that became very influential in Buddhism, especially in the branch known as Mahayana. But a lot of people also tend to misunderstand it or have trouble grasping what it is actually saying. Is it a kind of existential nihilism, claiming that nothing in reality exists, or is it more complicated than that? Today we're going to explore the teachings of Nagarjuna and try to understand his school of thought. When people think of Buddhism, they tend to picture things like ascetic monks sitting in meditation, often completely detached from the world in a zen-like state. But what many tend to forget is that Buddhism has one of the most rigorous philosophical or intellectual traditions in the world, which has contributed immensely to philosophy in general across history. The various Buddhist philosophers have written some of the most profound stuff, and one of the most famous, if not the most famous of these figures is the 3rd century thinker Nagarjuna. He is often considered the founder of a school known as Madhyamaka, or the middle way, as well as the most important systematizer for the idea of shunyata, or emptiness. And through this, he was one of the most central figures in the development of Mahayana Buddhism in particular. Again, Buddhism is divided into various schools and branches, and while these are many, it is generally thought that there are two or three main overarching branches of the religion. There is Theravada, which means something like the school of the elders and is the dominant form of Buddhism in places like Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar and Sri Lanka. Then there is Mahayana, which means the great vehicle, and is the largest branch of Buddhism, being the dominant form in places like China, Japan, Vietnam, Nepal, uh, Malaysia, and many other places. Sometimes Vajrayana, or Tantric Buddhism, is considered its own third major branch, while at other times it is seen as a sort of part of Mahayana Buddhism, but in any case, this school is most popular in Tibet and is the same as what is often known as Tibetan Buddhism as well. All of these branches, especially the first two, have various schools and movements within themselves, of course, but this is considered the most broad and general division of the religion. The differences between the branches are too many to cover here and it will hopefully become more clear over time, but in short they tend to accept different collections of texts as authoritative, have different monastic rules as well as significant doctrinal and practical differences. And the subject of today's episode, Nagarjuna, serves as one of the most important figures in the development of Mahayana Buddhism in particular, and his ideas became the foundation for much of that school and the basis on which many later movements were formed. Nagarjuna himself is an elusive figure. He is generally thought to have lived between the 2nd and 3rd centuries and in India. There are many different accounts of exactly when and where he lived, but of this general outline we can be relatively certain. 
Hagiographies state that he came from a Brahmin family, the highest caste in the Hindu tradition, and that he at some point in his life became a Buddhist. In particular, he eventually became affiliated with the Mahayana branch, which was a minority in the region at the time, and would indeed become one of the key figures in the development and later popularity of that tradition. Other than this, we can't say much at all about his life, other than that he was obviously a very gifted thinker who wrote works that would become classics in the history of philosophy and religion. His most famous work, in which he argues for some of the most central ideas associated with him, is the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, a real mouthful of a word that means something like root verses on the middle way. This work was so influential that a whole new school of thought within Mahayana Buddhism appeared around his teachings, which became known precisely as Madhyamaka, or the middle way, and we will see what this is referring to in due time. We will explore this work and the thought of Nagarjuna through two major themes in his writings. The idea of shunyata, or emptiness, probably the most famous idea he is associated with, as well as the doctrine of the two truths, which is another central teaching in Buddhism. So, let's get to it. In short, the teachings of shunyata, or emptiness, is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It states that all things in the world are empty. That is, they are empty of intrinsic nature or existence. There is nothing in the world that exists intrinsically, but everything is, as I said, empty. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, is this just existential nihilism? Is Nagarjuna saying that nothing at all exists? Many later... Uh, Non-Buddhist commentators and critics of Buddhism and Nagarjuna have often interpreted his teachings in this exact way, but this is actually not the case. This is a misunderstanding most, most of the time, and what Nagarjuna is saying is actually a lot more complicated than this. But to understand this fully, we kind of need a crash course in some basic Buddhist teachings. I'm sure many of you know some of the basics of the religion, like the Four Noble Truths, for example, that teach that life includes suffering, or life is suffering, um, that uh, there's a reason behind suffering, and that suffering can end, and then the path or way to end that suffering. The idea of emptiness is part of a discussion involving primarily two key aspects of Buddhism, the doctrine of no-self, or anatta, and the doctrine of dependent arising. The Buddha taught that there is no self, that the thing we think is ourselves, the thing we refer to when we say I, is actually an illusion. There is no enduring core or self in any human being, but only a collection of different skandhas or aggregates such as consciousness, mind and sensations that we sort of put together into this idea of a unified self that actually isn't really there. This is a very important feature of Buddhism that essentially all schools agree on, and realizing it is considered to be a central factor to reaching enlightenment and nirvana. Connected to this is the idea of dependent arising. This is essentially the idea that all things in the world are dependent in their existence on other things. Everything is temporary and exists only in dependence on everything else. The famous Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh once explained it beautifully through a flower. You may look at a flower and think that it exists in itself and independently, but this is not true. Try to think of that flower without the soil from which it grows, without the sunlight that helps it grow and illuminates it, without the very space in which it stands or without the particular time in which it is there. Suddenly you no longer have a flower at all. And this is true of all things in the world. There is nothing that exists independently. All things are constantly dependent on everything else for its existence. Even the parts that make up a specific thing are in themselves dependent on other things, and the parts of those parts are just the same. This leads to the conclusion that there kind of aren't any things at all, because all quote-unquote things we conceive in the world are only a collection of various other things that make it appear a certain way at a particular time. And it is us who conceptualize that thing into a false entity. There is a famous thought experiment or story in Buddhism that explores this question, and that is the story about the chariot in what is known as King Malinda's Questions. In this story, the King Melinda is having a discussion with a Buddhist sage called Nagasena. 
The king asks the sage about the doctrine of no self, how it can be that there is no such thing as the personal self when that seems like a, such an apparent reality to everyone. Nagasena points to a chariot and asks, what is a chariot? Is the chariot in the wheels? The king answers no. Is the chariot in the axles? Again, he answers no. Is it in the reins? Still no. Is it in the seat? The king answers in negative to all questions regarding the parts of the chariot, including if the chariot is simply the combination of all parts. Well, the Buddhist sage says, if the chariot cannot be found in any of the parts, then there is no chariot. The designation chariot is dependent on all these various parts, but in reality, quote-unquote chariot is only a concept, a name that is applied to something that doesn't actually have independent existence of its own. The self is the same way. We say that there is a self, we talk about ourselves using words like I, even the Buddha did so, because it is convenient and useful in the everyday world, but in reality there is no such thing, since it is only a name that we give to a collection of temporary aggregates. So these are some of the central features of Buddhism, and which become very important for the continued discussion that we're having here today. Um, basically all Buddhists agree on the basics of of these teachings, but they can disagree on some of the details and interpretations. So for example, how deep does the teaching of no self go? Does this simply mean that there is no self and basic things in the world have no existence as such, or is it even more radical than that? One collection of Buddhist schools that existed in antiquity were known as the Abhidharma. These were different groups that often used philosophical speculation to fill out some of the metaphysical questions and details of the Buddha's teachings. And these Abhidharmikas are important not only for the general history of Buddhist thought, but also for understanding Nagarjuna and the Madhyamaka school. Indeed, in his most central work, the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, Nagarjuna essentially spends the majority of the text responding to ideas put forth by the Abhidharmikas and bases his arguments often on refuting them. The Abhidharma schools are varied and can hold different ideas, but in general, they believe that there is no enduring self and that reality is characterized by impermanence and dependent arisings, just like all Buddhists. The conventional reality that we experience, consisting of things and events, are only conventional constructions and not ultimately real. There is no chariot, as we saw, just as there is no individual self. Anything that we experience is only a conceptual construct of a variety of factors and temporary happenings. None of these things are ultimately real. But according to the Abhidharmikas, there is something called dharmas, which are the ultimate constituents of reality. The dharmas are factors or phenomena that make up all things and events. They are ultimately real, although still dependent on each other. The dharmas are never experienced as individual things, but arise through dependence on each other and in constant flux. But it is these fluctuating dharmas that make up all of reality as we experience it, and we conceptualize all these temporary happenings as individual things, like the self, for example, or the chariot. But what is important here is that the dharmas are real. For something to be counted as real, according to Buddhist philosophy in this case, one must be able to say something ultimately true about them. They need to have an intrinsic nature, something that is inherently true about it in itself, independently. And the dharmas are that, according to the Abhidharmakas. The dharmas have intrinsic natures, and only one intrinsic nature per dharma. And all these factors, when interacting with each other, create the temporary happenings that make up our world. This is the general outlook that Nagarjuna is responding to in his great work. And he argues very forcefully that this perspective is mistaken and actually fails to uphold the principles of the Buddha. He instead takes a stand that appears at first glance to be even more extreme, but which actually claims to avoid extremity. He argues that there are no dharmas at all. There are no things that are ultimately real at all, not even these fluctuating basic components. There is nothing that can have intrinsic nature and therefore be categorized as real. Everything is empty. This is what is referred to when we talk about the teaching of emptiness or shunyata. To Nagarjuna, reality is characterized entirely by emptiness. All things are empty of intrinsic nature and are only conveniently conceptualized to be real. 
there can be no dharmas or ultimately real things. And he argues in the text for how these dharmas would in themselves have to be empty, and thus that would mean that they lose their status as dharmas to begin with. So there can't be any dharmas because dharmas are empty just like all other things. Quote, There being no dharma whatsoever that is not dependently originated, it follows that there is also no dharma whatsoever that is non-empty. Now, as stated before, many have taken this to mean that Nagarjuna affirms a kind of existential nihilism. Uh, many of his later critics, like the famous um, Vedantic uh, scholar, sage Shankara, who writes a couple of um, centuries later, uh, is one example of that. He often accuses Buddhists of being nihilists. But this is actually a misunderstanding of what Nagarjuna is saying here. What he and the Madhyamakas are saying is not that nothing exists at all, but rather that there is nothing that has an intrinsic or inherent nature or essence. Right? There is nothing that has an independent existence. Everything is empty, everything is dependent on everything else, and nothing has an intrinsic nature to it. So in that sense, it's kind of true that nothing exists because there are no things to exist in the world. There is only the constantly changing dependent arisings, which in themselves are empty. But that doesn't mean that what we experience isn't there at all on an ontological level as we normally understand it. It's not complete nothingness, right? Emptiness does not mean nothingness. That's a very important distinction. Indeed, this teaching of emptiness is a natural extension of the Buddha's teaching on no self and dependent arising. There is no self, no inherent essence to anything, because all things are dependent on everything else for its very existence. Nagarjuna argues that this precisely avoids nihilism and extremism. As the name of Yamaka suggests, it is a middle path between annihilationism, that things don't exist or can go out of existence entirely, on the one hand, and permanence, on the other hand, that there is anything at all that has permanence or is independent in its existence. And in the Mula Madhyamika Karika, he argues for this position in a very systematic way through tackling the topic from every conceivable angle using logical deduction. Nagarjuna makes it clear that, according to him, the teachings of the Buddha, when one considers them properly, must lead to the conclusion of emptiness. But one needs to be careful here not to consider it a statement of ultimate reality in itself either. Shunyata is a useful tool to collapse all ideas about objects with inherent natures, but it is not an ultimate truth about reality in itself. Emptiness is not the quote-unquote nature of things in that way. Quote, emptiness is not some kind of primordial reality, but a corrective to a mistaken view of how the world exists. To Nagarjuna, there are no ultimate truths at all, or rather, there is no ultimate reality, not even emptiness. Indeed, emptiness itself is empty. Quote, dependent origination we declare to be emptiness. It, that is emptiness, is a dependent concept. Just that is the middle path. After all, for emptiness to be a thing, there needs to be things that we deem to be empty. But as we saw, there are no such things, because everything is empty and without intrinsic nature. Which means, in the final analysis, that emptiness itself is empty, because it itself is dependent on things, which in themselves are empty. Does your head hurt yet? It's some trippy stuff that can be hard to wrap your head around, but to understand Mahayana Buddhism in general and all of the later movements that came after Nagarjuna, we kind of need to at least somewhat understand what he is trying to say. If you are an inquisitive person, you may have started asking yourself questions like, what does this mean for some of the basic principles of Buddhism? Like, for example, nirvana, or samsara and reincarnation, or karma, and all these different things. Are these things empty and ultimately not real too? The answer is, yes, indeed, they are. But here, it is important to introduce another one of the key features of Nagarjuna's thought, and that of a lot of Buddhism generally, which is the doctrine of the two truths. In simple terms, this is the idea that there are two essential ways of approaching reality, conventional truth and ultimate truth. Just like a lot of other Buddhist principles, this has been interpreted in different ways by different schools, but to Nagarjuna it is connected to the idea of emptiness. 
We can either look at the world through conventional truth, that is, through the concepts and constructs that we apply to it, that there are things in the world, that I am a human being, that there are things like nirvana and reincarnation. These conventional truths are accepted because they are useful in life. It is useful that I consider you and me to be different on some level for a fruitful interaction, and it is useful for me to see myself as distinct from a lion, or I'm probably going to be dead because I'm not careful. In the same way, the teachings of samsara, karma, and nirvana are useful for the individual to travel on the path to enlightenment, so to say. In a way, we need conventional truth to help us reach ultimate truth. And what is that ultimate truth then? Well, at least to Nagarjuna, it is that all things are empty. This idea of the two truths theory, as argued for in Nagarjuna's writings, would continue to be influential on later thinkers in Mahayana Buddhism. For example, it is on this basis that the later figure, Zhe Yi, founded the Tiantai school of Buddhism based on the idea of a three truths doctrine, a sort of extension of what Nagarjuna is arguing for here, something that we will definitely dedicate a future episode to. As you might imagine, this has only been a very simple and surface level introduction to the ideas of Nagarjuna and the Madhyamika school, but as I said, they are very important for understanding Mahayana. Buddhism, uh, understanding a lot of the later traditions in that, um, in that branch, in that school, and for understanding some of the basics of Buddhism and its teachings and history in general. In the future, we will explore more thinkers and movements, some that follow in the footsteps of Nagarjuna, and, but also others that are completely not connected to that tradition at all. We're finally doing some Buddhism content here, which is really exciting. I know a lot of you have been asking for uh, some Buddhism here, and we're finally doing it, which is uh, so much fun. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, as I said in the beginning, Buddhism is incredibly uh, diverse, it's complicated, um, and it's something that we will... Uh, try to tackle from many different angles and the strategy the idea is that by understanding major movements and thinkers within buddhism we will gradually start to get a broader picture of what that religion is as a whole buddhism has an incredibly rich philosophical and spiritual tradition that is just an ocean of interesting stuff to explore which I am very much looking forward to doing, and I hope you are as excited as I am to continue this journey of exploring Buddhism, as well as all other religions that we're dealing with here on Let's Talk Religion. So, thank you so much for watching. Thank you to all of my patrons who support this channel and keep things rolling. I would not be able to do this without any of you guys. Thank you so much. And a special shout out to two of my new saints, Frater G and Ahmed Sevki Altin. Thank you both so much. Um, if you want to become a patron yourself, then I will leave links to that in the description. It is, of course, really helpful for me to continue uh, bringing you free educational content here on YouTube about the world's different religions. Um, and I highly appreciate all the support I can get. But also feel free, of course, to like the video, leave a comment or subscribe to the channel. And I will see you next time.